I'm Andrew Thomas Price and welcome to the Bushcraft and Survival Skills Series. In this episode, I'll be looking at the practical and safe use of a bushcraft knife. When it comes to bushcraft, one of the things that we often discuss, perhaps more than we should, is what makes the perfect bushcraft knife. Now, I've used all sorts of different knives and I'm gonna show you today one of the knives that I use and also some of the safe techniques that I like to employ when I'm making things in the woods. So first of all, what makes a good bushcraft knife? So it doesn't have to be a huge blade. A lot of people think that it needs to be a big Rambo knife. That's not the case at all you're far better off having a four inch blade. That works really well. And I always favor carbon steel over stainless unless I'm near the sea. So a carbon steel knife is very easy to sharpen. One of the features we like to think about is the edge profile. Now that is the angle at which the edge is formed. Now you can see here, we have a change of angle from the flat part of the blade all the way to the cutting edge. And it's quite wide, it's probably about six millimeters or something like that. And this is what we call a Scandi grind. Now it's very flat, it works extremely well as a woodworking tool. You can use it for all sorts of different things, but it does have an extremely fine edge, which means that if you're butchering a deer, for instance, and you touch bone, you can often chip the blade. So your bushcraft knife is normally a fixed blade knife. It means it, it doesn't fold. Uh, folding knives also have their place. Another feature that I like to talk about is the tang. The tang on a bushcraft knife is the metal that continues from the blade into the handle. Now on some knives, it's a partial tang, um, and even some very good knives don't have a full tang, and it only comes to about two thirds of the way through. Very, very poor knives often have almost no tang at all. The knife that I'm using at the moment has what we call a full tang, and that means that the metal, the steel of the blade continues all the way through. One of the things that we should consider is the material that the handle is made from. Uh, we call these the scales if they're riveted on from both sides like this. Uh, sometimes they're molded on a single piece of plastic or other material. As far as I'm concerned, as long as it feels good in the hand, feels comfortable, it's a good handle. So you've bought your shiny new knife and you're very proud of it. But before you use it, let's look at some of the safety factors that we need to consider. Now, the first thing we'll talk about are safe working distances. Now, that means not being close to any other person while you're using a knife. So I always generally consider that to be two arm lengths away from anyone else while I'm using a knife. Now, that means if I get a little bit carried away and preoccupied, there's no way I can hit any other person with my knife while I'm carving. Now, the other thing we need to consider is when you're not using your knife, where do you put it? Now the only safe place for a knife to be when it's not in use is in its sheath or case. When your knife is in there, that's the safest place for it. What you don't want is a flimsy case that if you should fall on the, on the knife while you're walking through the woods, it will come through and injure you. So a good solid leather or plastic sheath is essential. Now, when I'm using my knife, it's in my hand. When I'm not using my knife, it's in its sheath. It's never stuck in a tree, in a log, on the floor, in the ground, anywhere else. Now, the other thing we'll talk about is your body positioning. So we've already established how to keep other people safe. So we've got our safe working distances, but what about ourselves? Now, if I'm in a standing position like this, I have a lovely clear area in front of me so I can work in this area, no problems at all. Now, the difference comes if I sit down, all of a sudden I've managed to create a problem. So my legs are now within the area that I was working. So instead of working in this area, which is where your femoral artery runs down both legs, we're gonna avoid that simply by leaning forwards. So I'm now working in a clear area, no problems at all. And by resting on my knees, it's actually quite a comfortable position to be in. Always be aware of your surroundings. So if you're working with a group of other people, you need to be aware of where they are at all times. Use your peripheral vision, and maintain your consciousness of where everyone is when you're using that knife. So all of these things help to prevent accidents. Let's move on to knife technique. And there are a lot of different things we can use a knife for, but I'm just gonna look at the basic ones now. And the best way that I've found to learn those basic skills is by making a tri-stick. So what I'm gonna do, put a point at one end, 
and I'll round the other end off. In between, I'll be making a series of different notches. So I'll start that now, and I think we'll start with making a point. So starting in a good, comfortable position, nice, clear area, and I'm consciously aware of everyone around me. I want you to take your knife out, and I'm right-handed, so I'll hold the knife in my right hand in a solid fist grip so that I have a lot of contact between the palm of my hand and my fingers and my thumb very securely wrapped around the handle of the knife. So I'll just start by making a point. And I'm beginning my cut approximately five centimeters back from the end of the stick. All the force comes from my left arm. So my right arm is locked out and I'm pulling back like this. And each time I pull, I'm removing a specific amount of wood. Now, if you find this too easy and you're taking thin shavings, just tilt the blade slightly more so that you're taking thicker pieces. Now, that's one way of achieving the point. An alternative technique that you can use is what I call the chicken dance or chest lever technique. So you take the piece of wood that you're carving and you take the knife with the blade, this time facing back towards you by lifting your elbows really high, twisting so that you can put your fists up against your chest. You find yourself in this position with the blade and the piece of wood that you're working crossed. Now it really needs to be quite close, but what this allows you to do is to employ your back and shoulder muscles in order to take very, very powerful cuts. So if you have a lot of material to remove in a very short time, you can employ this particular technique and it works extremely well. That's a point, so whether you're making a tent peg or a vampire stake, that's how you'll do it. So I'm now gonna sit down and show you another possible method of peeling the bark. So what I do is take the knife and I put it just beneath my kneecap. So put the back of the blade just where the handle meets, right in just below your kneecap. And now what we can do is to pull the material that we're working towards the cutting edge of the blade that we're taking fine shavings as we go along. Now, I use the same technique for making feather sticks, which I'll show you in a moment. The next thing I'm gonna do is flip everything around and I'll do a different technique in order to round the top off. Now, for this technique, I'll put my thumb on the back of the blade. And now putting the work between my, my arm and my body, I'm now using both thumbs and pushing and it's almost a pivoting motion on my left thumb to flick away material. So as I work my way around, and we just rotate the material until we've got to the, the rounded surface that we need. This is a technique I like to use when I'm forming the rounded tip of the bow drill, uh, or if I'm making a tent peg, I round the top of it off uh, there are a million possible uses for this technique. Okay, so there's a rounded top here. Now the next thing I'm going to start doing is a technique called battening. So I'm going to hit the back of my blade with a heavy piece of wood in order to split another piece of wood. So here we go, give it a few good whacks. There we go, so I've split that down. Now. I've got some lovely dry wood on the inside here, which we can use for making feather sticks. So I'll show you how to do that. I'll return back to my seated position. And I'm gonna remove the outer bark to start with. So I'll just shave that off using the knee draw technique. The idea behind feather sticks is that if you're in a wood that's been rained on for months and months like this one, all the material that you find on the floor is very likely to be damp. So what we're looking for is some dead standing and the material that we have on the inside should be bone dry and perfect for making feather sticks. So I'll get started with that now. Exactly the same technique for shaving the bark off, but I'm just gonna make very, very controlled cuts. The first few generally do fall off, but try and stop just before you get to the end. I'll generally make four or five feather sticks before I start trying to light the fire. And uh, they are very, very effective and are almost guaranteed to get your fire going. And they do look very pretty and something very similar 
was sold by gypsies traveling door to door and they were known as gypsy flowers, often dyed different colors uh, just to brighten up people's homes. So a wonderful ancient tradition that we can continue in our bushcraft practice here. But, uh, there we go. So that's one completed feather stick. So if you can imagine four or more of those is a guaranteed way to get a fire going, no matter what the conditions. So that is a feather stick. Notches have a lot of different uses. You can make all sorts of different things. You can join pieces of wood together. The other thing you can use them for is to make triggers for traps, pot hangers, all manner of things. So learning how to make good, neat notches is well worth perfecting. So I've got my piece of wood here and I'm gonna just put my knife at about a point around here and give it a few good whacks with a stick. Good heavy log is ideal for that. So I've cut at right angles into the wood and now using a different technique so I'm putting my thumb on the back of the blade here and pushing with both thumbs up towards that stopper cut I can remove material very accurately. So this particular notch, uh, flat notch, will be ideal for making trigger traps, pot hangers, all sorts of different things. And we're going to cut about halfway into the wood. So we're almost there now. So that's the flat notch completed. The next notch is called the parrot beak notch. At least that's what I call it. So to make a parrot beak notch, what we'll do is make two cuts using the battening technique into the wood. So I'm going to give it a few good smacks here. So I've made a cross into the wood there. Now I'll remove the lower part of the cross, leaving the upper part as the beak. This is where you really value having a very sharp knife, because uh, if you try doing this with a blunt knife, you just end up making a real mess of it. And of course a blunt knife is far more dangerous than a sharp knife, which is why in a future episode of the series I'll be looking at knife sharpening so that's a really important safety factor and also very important for the versatility of a knife. And there we have the completed parrot beak notch. So the next notch I'm going to make is a square notch. So I'm going to cut in two different ends So we now have two stopper cuts. We have the first stopper cut here, the second stopper cut here, and I'm going to cut in from the central point towards each stopper cut. So it's almost the same as the flat notch, but working in two different directions. Now this is a particularly good notch if you're planning to join two pieces of wood. So if you're building a shelter or any kind of frame, you can make a notch on two pieces of wood join them together, try and get the size as close as possible as you can, and then by square lashing you make a very, very solid attachment point. So I've made my cuts one way, I'm now going to turn it around and go the other way. So I'm really forcing the blade, uh, it's a very sharp blade so it doesn't require too much effort, but I'm pushing with both thumbs towards the stopper cut, so I'm creating this nice square notch here. Now we have three notches here, but there must be dozens of different notches, all have different purposes, and these three should get you started. Maybe in a few years time when you've got the hang of all of these, you can teach me a few new ones as well. So I hope you've enjoyed the video as much as I've enjoyed making it, and if you have, please like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time.